meet with the elders. He wanted to communicate something to them. He met with the elders of the church, verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plot of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life on, of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. This is not the entirety of, uh, and we'll stop here in verse 24, but this isn't the entirety of his message to the elders. But this week, this is the portion that we're going to focus in on and uh, begin to uh, break down and, and study. Um, this morning, to give you some, you know, lay out the background, lay out what's going on in the setting, right? So Paul calls the Ephesian elders to him. Ephesus is about 30 miles away from Miletus, and so they travel these 30 miles to meet with him. And uh, he's close enough there to be able to meet with those elders, the, the leaders of the church in Ephesus. And um, that the word that's used there, elders, is just to define the mature men that are leading the church in those spiritual matters. They were serving and they were shepherding the church. There are... Um, several of them, as it is mentioned, that there's a, there's a plurality of them as they're serving the church. And um, this conversation comes up. We don't really know exactly why Paul has this conversation with them. This could be that Paul's giving a defense of himself against someone who's trying to undermine his ministry. And he says, all right, I need to talk to the elders to make sure they know. I need to remind them who I am, what I've done, and make sure they know that I'm still on their side. And uh, he's clarifying as he... Um, mentions later that there are these these wolves that are that are attacking the church and he's worried about the church because of those that are coming in to um to attack it and so it could be as it says in verse 29 after his departure wolves will come in it could be that he's worried about that and he wants to make sure that the church knows that they're still working together and he's reaffirming the things that he's taught them it may be that he's meeting with these elders to give them a pattern for ministry with this final exhortation knowing that he's on his way to finish his ministry. And it, it could just be that he's, both things are taking place here. Number one, he's saying, hey, I'm on your side. We're still working together on this. Even though people may come in and attack the church, we're still working together. And he's saying, look, my life, let it be an example so that you know how to serve in ministry. And I, I would lean more towards that, that option that there's those two things that are taking place. What's interesting in the book of Acts there's not very many messages that are recorded that are given to specifically believers. Um, as a matter of fact, this is the only time that there is a message that is specifically given to believers. And so usually when there's a, a message and exhortation and there's uh, unbelievers that are involved, there's outreach that's taking place. And here, um, it is just geared towards those believers, especially those leaders of the church. Okay? So Paul calls the elders, um, and uh, he calls to their mind the ministry that he had among them the whole time he was in Ephesus. He wants them to remember his ministry, and he uses his life then as a proof of the, the next thing that he's going to bring to their attention. He says, all right, guys, you know who I am. We served together. Uh, they were together for a number of years. And um, so he says, look, uh, you, you know my life. He says in verse 18, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. He says, You have watched the way that I have served, and uh, now I need to meet with you and, and talk with you. What's interesting in Acts chapter 20 is that you have this conversation that takes place, and it's uh, you, go back, you can go back and forth on the different motives, and, and in any case, we know that Paul is he's getting to the end of his ministry, and this is, as he declares to them, the last time that he's going to be able to see them face to face. 
And so what we have here is kind of these uh, last words of Paul to the elders, encouraging them and exhorting them in their, in their ministry. This is the, um, the famous last words, right? And uh, so they become very important. And the thing is, the way that Paul lived his life is what makes these words so important. Had, had Paul been a hypocrite, had he been someone who taught one thing and did another, um, what point would they have in taking in these words and, and being so, um, so careful in understanding these things? So as we get ready to go into this, this text a little bit further, there's some simple application that comes right at the beginning of this. And that is to um, recognize the way that we live our life. It's either going to give credence to the things that we say or it will cause our words to be empty. We're supposed to live in such a way that when we have that opportunity to speak, if it's, especially if it's our last opportunity, that it will be listened to, it will be respected, right? There's a, a number of um, famous last words. And, uh, you know, there's some funny ones, right? Like, uh, here, hold this, or uh, um, I don't know. I, I won't go any further, right? There's, there's a number of... Um, Things that's like a ridiculous last word. This is not a ridiculous last word because of the life that Paul lived, right? And so we get into this a little bit further. We see, first of all, Paul's service to God in verse 19. His service to God. We see that his service is done with all hum uh, humility and his service is done faithfully. He says, you guys know how I served among you. I was with you the whole time. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. His service was to God. First and foremost, he was about serving the Lord. The things an elder does must be done with a view towards serving God. It must be done towards a view of serving God. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul reminds us here that he says, For I am now seeking, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He says, I am a servant of God. I'm not working to serve men. I am all about serving Christ. He's trying to um, he says, I'm not trying to please men through the things that I do. He says, if I do try and please men, then I'm not a servant of Christ. There's that, you're either one or the other. You can't serve two masters, right? You're either serving God or you're serving something else. Okay, so now the question comes up. All right, he's talking to elders, so I can dismiss this, right? And he's talking to leaders in the church. What point does this have for me? Well, we look at another passage that very clearly um, puts us all in the same boat. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 and eight, five through 8, it says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh. And in that, that time frame, a slave was more of a, a work, worker, a boss, worker relationship. With fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart, you serve your master with, according to the um, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will rendered service, render service as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. So, we all ha should have this kind of focus, this mentality of, all right, when I do this, I'm doing it for the Lord. I'm not doing it because my husband or my wife wants me to. I'm not doing it because uh, someone else expects me to. I'm not doing it um, for my boss because this, you know, I want to, um, you know, whatever reason there is, there's a bigger reason in that we do it for the Lord. Things that you do, they can be done as unto the Lord. And this transforms everything that a believer does. The motives of the believer are radically different from, from the world's motives, right? And so as we look at this, we can say, okay, so the question that comes out of this is, well, who do I serve? Am I serving God? 
Or am I doing this for some other reason, for some other purpose? Why do you do the things that you do? What motivates you to go to work each day, to go to school each day, to feed your children, right? What motivates you to change diapers? Because I hate the way it smells, right? No, it's your opportunity, even in changing diapers, to serve the Lord. What motivates you to do house projects or to serve in the church? I think sometimes people um, serving in church, it can be an opportunity for you to, um, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, be recognized by others. And so there's a, uh, there's a concern and a carefulness about that to make sure that everybody who serves within the church is not doing it because someone asked them to or because they're trying to make the pastor happy or because they have some other motive in why they do the, what they do. It, is, it should be because they want to serve the Lord. And that's what Paul says. He says, I've been through all of this, and I, I was serving the Lord. And he says, this is how I did it. I did it with all humility. This is how this service is to be done, with all humility. In 1 Peter chapter 5, there's this exhortation to the, the leaders of the church again. And in 1 Peter 5, verse 2, he says, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet, um, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the unfading crown of glory. He says, And all of you, later on, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so he says, look, this is, uh, this is the way you do it. You're able to serve, and you serve the Lord with all humility. Um, it's interesting in that First Peter passage that there's that mention of the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd is the one who has demonstrated humility to us, giving us an example to follow. Last week we talked about this idea of meekness or of humility and Jesus and in uh, Philippians chapter 2, we are supposed to have this attitude in ourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who uh, humbled himself. Can you imagine the, um, oh, I don't think we can imagine, right? Moving from heavenly abode with the heavenly Father and then taking on flesh. The humility that would be displayed in putting on hu humanity. Not only did he put on humanity, but he went a step further and he was then killed on a cross, humbled to the point of death. And we have that example in the chief shepherd, and so um, we then are also encouraged to walk this way. It's like Paul says, uh, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. Humility is something that is essential in serving the Lord. Humility essentially is, uh, if you were to give it a definition, it's seeing yourself as Christ does. Not thinking of yourself higher than you ought to think of yourself. When we see ourselves, it should be in alignment with what Christ says about us, with what he has deemed us to be. We can recognize our inadequacies, right? But those inadequacies are the things that can drive us towards that reliance on him and it is recognizing those inadequacies that, um, that display humility and a reliance on Him. So Jesus is our example of humility. Paul is an example of humility. We should imitate His uh, willingness to rely on and serve the Father. And His service, it is done faithfully. It's done faithfully. Faithfully it is done through tears and through trials gets those those elders together and he says look I, I cry sometimes I did it with these tears through these trials ministry is an emotional endeavor if you're going to love people then you will cry right if you're gonna love people then you will cry uh, people bring tears, and they bring tears for different reasons. And when Paul talks about his tears, when he talks about the times that he cried, um, there's a few different reasons for his sorrow. 
We see that he has great sorrow and unceasing grief for the lost. And he mentions that in Romans chapter 9. Paul wrote, he writes to the Corinthians uh, with many tears to correct their sin. He says, ah, you shouldn't be living this way. You need this correction. He cries over false teachers. He admonishes them with, with tears, even here in this, in this passage. And probably, uh, since it's closest to what he's talking about, it may be even more on his mind as he mentions this. But in verse 31, he says, Therefore, be on the alert. Remember that night and day... For a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. This is how I was serving you. And tears are kind of like the, uh, the byproduct of, of love. And so because he has this uh, affection for the church, because he has this love for his fellow elders, he says, look, I, you're dear to me. You faithfully serve through those tears. Um, not only did he serve faithfully through tears but also through those trials if tears show like the inner hardships the difficulty of, of serving as a leader um, then the trials show the um, exterior hardships Paul endured those hardships that were um, brought on by the Jews as he mentions here Paul was faithful he kept his service focused on God when he was faced with physical difficulty, he didn't stop. It's like, oh, they stoned me again. Maybe I should give up this time. No, it was a, it was a continual, I'm going to serve God. And wherever he leads me, that's where I'm going to go. And I'm going to keep on pursuing what he wants me to pursue. We find out later on that he says that he's bound by the Holy Spirit. He is so in tune with God, what God wants. He is so um, closely associated with um, serving God that when the Holy Spirit directs him, it is as if he is bound by the Holy Spirit to do those things. The service is done faithfully with tears and with trials. He perseveres. He continues forward. He meets together with these elders. He says, look, this is the way ministry is. It's going to be hard. You're going to cry. But you're going to serve the Lord with humility. He says in all of this, verse 20, we see Paul, he brings this uh, to his teaching and we see Paul's teaching to the church. Second point this morning. He taught what was profitable. He taught them in different settings, and he taught different groups. So first he deals with like the relational difficulties and the uh, physical difficulties. But then he says, all right, so but while you're doing those things, there's also a mission of what you're trying to communicate. His teaching to the church, he taught what was profitable. He says, you know how I did not shrink from declaring to you, verse 20, anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I didn't hold anything back. I wasn't shrinking back, even though I went through difficulty, I, even though I love these people and I, I, hate to, I hate to see them hurt, even though there's a hardship, facing the, the struggle that the Jews brought upon him, he said, I didn't, I didn't shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Question, what is profitable? First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, Equipped for every good work. So what was Paul teaching them? He's teaching them the word of God. He's come back to the scripture. He didn't skip through things, right? He would have been very clear about the atonement coming from Christ alone, right? There's no nothing you can add to that. He would have been very clear about that. Very clear about sin. And there are some pastors nowadays that don't like to talk about sin or don't enjoy they skip over passages that deal with difficult things deal with hell deal with what's going to happen in the end times they skip over things that are are difficult with our um, uh, political climate right Paul says look if it was profitable I told you about it 
I didn't hold anything back. And in many ways, he's given this example to these elders and reminding them of this ministry that they had together. They were faithful to proclaim the truth of God's word. Not only were they um, teaching what is profitable, but he taught them in different settings. He taught them in public, and he taught them in private. He didn't shrink back in sharing what was profitable and teaching you publicly. And from house to house. Publicly, he went into the synagogue and taught. He had the school of uh, Tyrannus there in which he taught. And then privately, he went from house to house. Now, this is not specifically talking about like outreach and maybe going door to door. But it's more of a, a private explaining of scripture. I think what, what this looks like is he's, he's doing life with people. He's going in and hanging out with them in their own home. And it gives them the opportunity to have conversations that they may not have the opportunity to, to share in more of a public setting. And so he comes into the private setting, and they're able to have those conversations. And uh, people are able to grow and develop as he teaches in these different settings. Um, more, it looks like, doing life with people. I remember um, whenever I was in, uh, in Peru, I was speaking to a group of pastors there. And uh, I was encouraging them to go and visit people in their homes and to, to do things with people. And, and they were kind of pushing back against that. And they said, well, don't sick people go to the hospital? Shouldn't, they, shouldn't people who are sick come to the church? And I, not knowing the, the setting or the culture and the situation, I, I was just asking my translator, like, well, do they not have, you know, do they have um, ambulances? And he's like, uh, I don't know, I'll ask him. <laughs> and so he asks, and then there's like this uproar where it seemed like I smacked that guy across the face, like, don't you know about ambulances? And it was this uh, big deal with it. You know, people were giving him a hard time for asking a question like that. The thing is, there, there, um, there is that opportunity for us to be able to minister to people, not just in the church, although the church is a primary place, but there's also the house-to-house opportunities that come with that. So it's good for elders, for leaders in the church to be ministering to people in different places. What does that mean for you, right? What that means for you is hang out with me, right? Spend time with the, with the elders. Uh, if you have questions, I love to talk about those kinds of questions. If you have something that I talk about on a Sunday morning and you don't quite understand or it doesn't make sense or I say something that uh, doesn't seem to fit, talk with me about those things. Let's, let's just get together and have... Um, have coffee or have a meal together and uh, give us the opportunity to have those conversations so that we're all benefited in those discussions okay so what he taught was profitable he taught them different in different settings he also taught these different groups he says i was testifying both to jews and to greeks um he spoke to these two different groups he says look i wasn't partial I went into these situations, the Jews, yeah, there were some of them that wanted to kill me, but I, I'm still a Jew, and he wanted to share the gospel with them, and with the Greeks, he wanted to meet with them, and his message was the same with both of these groups. He wanted to testify of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Testifying to both Jews and Greeks, he spoke of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice his testimony was centered around the work and person of Jesus Christ. Who do I need to know in order to have a relationship with God? It's Jesus. Why do we need to know who Jesus is? Because we're a sinner, right? And um, we need to repent. He's preaching repentance. And uh, there's that recognition or that... that, uh, uh, acknowledgement of the sinfulness of the people. Say, hey, we're sinful and we need a Savior. He goes to these people and he says, look, you need to put your faith in Jesus. That will, that's the only way you can be saved from your sins. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection being what made the way for them to have a relationship with God, which makes a way for us to have this relationship with God. He preaches nothing that would be, he preaches everything that would be profitable, 
and at the center of that message is Jesus. Because look, it begins with knowing who he is. These people, they need to know who he is. And so he communicates that message. There is a Savior. He continues forward in verse 22, and I think it's interesting here because within this passage in which he um, communicates with the leaders, he, he acknowledges all parts of the Trinity being involved in his work and in his ministry. In verse 22, he says, And now, behold, being bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. At this point, Paul has set his mind towards Jerusalem, and then from there to Rome. He, uh, he has this goal in mind of reaching Jerusalem. And in many ways, he wants to reach Jerusalem because he, um, he's been given this, this ministry by God, as verse 24 continues, But I do not consider my life of any account as, uh, as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the testimony which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. He says, this is what God has called me to do. I'm going to finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, and I'm going to continue to pursue what the Lord has instructed me to do. So the last thing we see this morning, number three, is Paul's focus to finish his course. His focus in finishing his course. Now, there are a lot of things that happen from this point forward, but he is very de determined and um, uh, set on making his way to Jerusalem. So much so that he says that this is how it is. I'm bound by the Holy Spirit. I'm on my way to Jerusalem. And Paul sees his ministry as being, as I mentioned before, so tied to his service to God that he says he is a captive to the Holy Spirit. He is a slave of God. He is bound by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit wills that Paul go to Jerusalem, then Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem. That's how it works. And so he, he moves forward. Even when he doesn't know what will happen. Can you relate with that? Right? I can relate with that. He says, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. He says, I don't really know what's going to happen. All I know is that it's not going to be good. He follows the Spirit even when he doesn't know what to expect. He follows the Spirit even when, moving forward, he knows that there are bonds and afflictions that await him. Let me ask you this question. Would the knowledge of trouble ahead cause you to avoid that place or to change your plans even if you knew it was what God wanted we tend to enjoy comfort and ease Paul says hey if this is what God wants for me I'm going to do it I'm going to do it he continues on he says but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. He says, my life is not it's not that important. God's going to take care of it. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. And uh, the question that comes out of that is really, uh, is God worth it? Right? Is he worth it? Is God worth your life? And Paul says, if God calls me to the ministry... And I can trust that he will help me to complete it. He plans to finish his course and the ministry that he received from the Lord Jesus. And if the Lord calls us to it, usually he uh, enables us to, um, to complete it. So he says, this is my life and it's not really, I'm just putting it in God's hands. Question again, is God worth it? I think we would all say, yeah, God's worth it. It's, it's worth trouble. Until you get into the middle of it. You're like, I gotta get out of this. This hurts. Uh, this one, it makes me sweat a little bit. 
I don't like the way this feels. And all the way through it, we have to ask ourselves that question, is God worth it? And he says, this is my ministry, which I received from the Lord Jesus. He says, I'm a, I'm a servant of Jesus. And as a servant of Jesus, he has given me this role. He has given me this responsibility. He's given me this message to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. It's interesting how Paul words this. He points out that his ministry is to, to testify but it's important to see how the gospel is of the grace of God. As we mentioned earlier today, Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is um, of God's grace that people are saved, that the good news makes sense, that, uh, that there is good news, right? And so he testifies of this good news of the grace of God, the grace of God being that he has made a way for us to have that relationship with him. Salvation only comes through the grace of God, right? Um, I think sometimes um, it is hard for us to wrap our minds around that concept, that it is this message that God has given to us that we are able to proclaim to people, and then by proclaiming that message, people come to know who He is. Um, we serve a big God, yes, so big that He says, "You people who messed up, I'm going to still use you, and I'm going to use you to proclaim the most precious message that could ever be proclaimed, and how I love people." That's what God says. It's incredible that God would bring us into that place of being used by him to communicate something like that. This is Paul's ministry. And he, he brings all of this back to the elder's mind. He says, look, this is what you need to remember. I served with you, and this is how ministry went. It was hard. It was difficult. But I served the Lord. And no matter what happens, I'm going to keep serving the Lord. We're going to even bound by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to serve the Lord to finish this course in the ministry which I've received from Lord Jesus. He says, I'm going to proclaim the gospel no matter what. This morning, um, whether you are an elder or not, we have all been given that commission of proclaiming the gospel. And the question comes back up again. All right, if that's what you've been called to do, is God worth it? Is God worth it? Well, what if someone makes fun of you? What if they tell you that the things that you say are weird? What if they don't want to hang out with you anymore? What if it causes difficulty within a relationship? Sure, there's a right way to go about proclaiming the gospel, and we should try and preserve those relationships, but at the same time, when God calls you to proclaim it, then we are to proclaim it. When he gives you an opportunity, you're supposed to take that opportunity. And so we wrestle with this. Even elders wrestle with this, right? <gasps> the elders of the church. Okay, the elders can, but not the pastor. Oh, the pastor is an elder. What does that mean? The pastor can't wrestle with these things. Oh, he does. He does. Is God worth it? Are we willing to set aside our own desires, be humble, and serve the Lord above all else? And Paul says, this is what I did, you elders, I'm exhorting you. This is also the way that you should be doing these things. And um, as, uh, as the elders are to be an example to the congregation, the congregation should also be doing these things. The church should also be doing these things. In conclusion, we are to be a humble, faithful servant of God, engaged in learning and wholly devoted to finishing our ministry well. That's good for now. We'll pick up the rest next week as Paul continues to exhort these elders. Let's pray together. 
And Father, we are um, so grateful that you and your grace and your mercy have saw fit to redeem us and to make us a people that is able to be used by you for your glory. Father, I thank you that as we um, humble ourselves, as we um, remain faithful, that you are able to use us to finish the, the course that you've set us on. Father, I pray that we would walk so closely with you that we would know very clearly what the Holy Spirit desires of us and that we might recognize the desire of the Holy Spirit as being something that um, captures us because we want to be your servants. We want to relinquish our control for your control. And Father, whenever we find ourselves struggling with a fear of man or a fear of anything other than you, God, I pray that you would uh, bring to our attention what it takes to be a servant. Father, I pray that you would, you would guide us as, as a church, as we seek to um, have leaders that are committed to um, proclaiming the gospel, to um, preaching through the word of God. Father, I pray that you would help Help this church to uh, honor you in the way that it is, um, it is put together. I pray that both the leaders in the congregation might honor you. Father, I pray that you would um, give us boldness and courage. I pray that you would help us to do hard things. I pray that you would Give us wisdom in proclaiming your truth. Father, thank you again so much for allowing us to be a part of your plan in redeeming people. Help us not to take that for granted. Help us not to um, minimize the, the greatness of that commission. Father, I pray that you would help us to... Um, Help us to love people the way that you do. Help us to see ourselves the way that you do. And I pray that this week you would use us as tools in your hands. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.